praise as our pastor comes to preach Jesus to us this morning. Praise God. Thank you very much. Turn in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 3. I am preaching in Pastor Mitchell's place. They had a scheduling error. He's in Holland, so it's difficult for him to preach here. So Pastor Campbell asked me, and of course I was thrilled to be able to preach the Word of God. John chapter 3 is where we're going to uh, go in the Word of God. I was uh, preaching recently, and a number of uh, younger people in their 20s, that uh, I know these people, they were tangibly different, very different than they have been in the past. It was noticeable. And I asked the, the pastor, what has happened to these people? And he said, they got saved. <laughs> the reason why that is remarkable is they never left church. They were involved in ministry, most of them for many years. Some of them have even gone out to pastor. But now, the light of the gospel is shining. And they've come to the conclusion, I'm not saved. In our scripture, Jesus gives the non-negotiable entrance into relationship with God. He says, you must be born again. I was uh, so stirred after... Uh, I, uh, since that time, I'm, I've been uh, laying hold of God, challenging in our own church and everywhere I go. I'm going to preach a sermon from John chapter 3 that I have cleverly titled, You Must Be Born Again. <laughs> Let's read together. Let's start at verse 1. We're going to skip a little bit through, but starting at verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees. Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered, uh, and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of, is of Israel and you don't know these things? Let's skip to verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You must be born again. Let's begin. Let's talk about the confrontation. This story, Nicodemus comes to speak with Jesus. There is a lot to commend Nicodemus for. There's a lot to be desired. He's a good man. He wouldn't have had this position unless he was good. He was familiar with Scripture. As a Pharisee, they devoted themselves to the Scripture, the Word of God. He would have been respected by others. The Bible calls him a ruler of the Jews and he is a, a polite, a nice man, and even shows some interest. We know that you're a teacher from God. But Jesus confronts him. He says, none of that is good enough. You must be born again. Jesus is saying, you are not right with God. You are, what you are is not acceptable to God. We would say, you're not a Christian. You are not saved. Jesus deals with the problem of spiritual blindness here. Verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This man thinks he's coming for a chat. I, I would like to chat and speak about spiritual things. Jesus says, you don't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you are blinded. This is the frightening possibility 
that we could be blinded to our true condition, that we somehow could not be right with God. That is the last thing that Nicodemus expects when he comes to speak with Jesus. You know, it's possible to be blinded by our knowledge. There are people here, you know the Bible, you know the songs, you know things about the fellowship. Some of you are blinded by proximity. You're in church this morning, and I'm glad you are. You're around the things of God, so you assume that you're right with God. You can be blinded by familiarity. All the Christian things are comfortable to you. You can be blinded by comparison. You see raw sinners come in, and you say, well, I'm not like them. I mean, they're real. No, I'm not. Thank God I'm not like that. And you can be blinded by involvement even. The Bible says he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a spiritual ruler. He was heavily involved in leading. Let me tell you something. If you go to church and you are helpful, that doesn't mean you're saved. When I first pioneered, I had a a number of powerful converts. A woman got saved. The wife got powerfully saved. The husband, he would process and he's thinking about this. He came for five months. There was no one more helpful than him. He, if there was help that was needed, he was there, but he was not born again. If being helpful is not enough. Listen, because you are in ministry does not mean that you are a Christian. I'm astounded when I get people that come to me and say, oh, yeah, Pastor, i got to confess. You know, I haven't been saved for years. You were in the play last night. Yeah, I've, I've never been. Uh, yeah, I, I've never been born again. This is the thing that astounds me. We have in larger churches. We have children's church. This astounds me. We have kids that are raised, and it's a glorious thing in our church. They call young servants, and they become involved in puppet ministries and taking offerings and helping all that. How can it be someone raised in church, they can be a children church star, turn 18, and you never see them again? Because they were never born again. And yet, they're in ministry. That's what Jesus is looking to, a ruler of the Jews. So Jesus says, the essence of salvation is a new birth, verse 3 Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The language here is specific. This is salvation. You must be born again. It is birth. And this is very, very important. I want to tell you something. September 9th, 1964, at 11, 11 a.m., I was born. There was no doubt about that. I was not at 11.09, 11.11, I was born. Listen, my mother didn't describe to people and say, you know what, as summer gave way to fall, Greg was being born. No, 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 I either was or I was not. It is a birth. Listen, salvation is an event. It is not a process. Sanctification is a process. Salvation is an event. There may have been a process that brought you to the point of being born again. And I want to tell you something. This thought is absolutely being attacked in the church world. <coughs> what the church world describes, and, they, and this is not a, 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 a term of endearment, they mock what we believe as crisis conversion. Yeah, 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 the potter's house at the door, you all believe in crisis conversion. Crisis doesn't have to do with trouble, although there's a lot of people here, it was trouble that brought you to Jesus. Crisis means turning point. We believe that when you come to Jesus, there is a definite turning point. You must be born again. That is the time when I was born again. And in the church world, that is being attacked. No, no, no. You, that's not what you, what you, uh, what you do. In, in our church world, uh, there are some buzzwords about salvation. What they are trying to say is, no, no, no. 
you should belong and then believe and then you become a Christian. And that could be a long process. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says you must be born again. A, a Bible word that is used is saved. Somebody that's in the middle of a fire, of a burning car, you see this, and someone dragged them out. They didn't say, you know, over months, I was sort of coming out of the fire. No, no, no. I was in there, and they pulled me out. <laughs> saved. That is salvation. Listen, the event of being born again may not be the same for every person. For one person, it is deeply emotional. They weep tears. Another person, not a tear is shed. Your salvation doesn't have to be exactly like mine. But I'm going to tell you something. There should be a point in time in which you can say, I was born again. This is what salvation is. This is more than information because the great word, I was just speaking to someone, challenging them about uh, 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 salvation and, and uh, why do you think you are, are saved? Why do you think you're... Because I believe. But information is not enough. James 2.19, you believe there's one God, you do well, but even demons believe. How many of you know demons are not saved? Some people, they're basing their salvation. I believe in Jesus, and I go to church, and so do demons. <laughs> salvation is a miracle of God. How can Nicodemus ask, how can you be born when you're old? How can you enter in to your mother's womb and be born Jesus is nothing less than a miracle. This is what salvation is. Ezekiel 37 talks about God putting a new heart inside of us. Peter speaks about the life of God that is put inside of us. This is a spiritual transaction. Listen, I don't mean to hang you up if you can't remember, you know, the exact second that you were saved. But listen to me. Jesus says... If you just say, say, I was raised in church and somewhere I became a Christian, I'm sorry, that cannot be defended by the Bible. How many of you believe that everything that we live and do must be based on the Word of God? The Word of God gives us the standard, you must be born again. Bishop John Taylor, he was preaching in a large cathedral about the necessity of a new birth. And to drive home this point, he said, don't substitute anything for the new birth. He said, you can be a member of the church and yet not be born again because unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. He pointed to the rector. This is a, a, a man a, 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 who works for the church. And he says, and you cannot be born again. You might be a clergyman and yet not be born again. He pointed to an archdeacon. He said, you can be like the archdeacon and not be born again because the Bible says you must be born again. He pointed at the bishop and he said, you might be a bishop and not be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. Two days later, he got a letter. This letter was written from the archdeacon. He said, my dear bishop, you have found me out. I've been a clergyman for over 30 years, but I have never known the joy that Christians speak of. I could never understand it. Mine has been a hard legal service. I didn't know what was wrong with me, but when you pointed to me and said you might be an archdeacon and not be born again, I realized what the trouble was. I am not born again. They got together. They looked over scriptures and the archdeacon bowed his knee in his study and was born again. Let's talk secondly about the transformation. Because Jesus tells us the essence of being born again. Because if, if believing is not enough, that's the buzzword of the church. Do you believe? If believing is not enough, then what does it mean to be born again? 
In our scripture, Jesus immediately shifts to the Old Testament story of the bronze serpent. Numbers 21, God's people. They're murmuring against God. They're complaining against God. We don't want to be here. They're, they're rebelling against God and the snakes bite them and they are dying. And so you know this, God's answer, put a bronze serpent up on a pole, lift it up and tell the people to look at that. So Nicodemus, how, uh, I, don't, I don't get it. What, what, what do you mean? If I believe, if I'm good, if I'm involved, if I'm nice, that's not good enough. How do you get born again? Jesus tells, he says, this story is what you need. Here is people's problem. Every human being has a problem, and that is we are rebels against God. How many of you know every drug addict is a rebel? Your problem isn't drugs, you're a rebel. The manifestation of your rebellion is drugs. Every gangster is a rebel. Yes, yes, you're a rebel. But every church member who attends church and makes plans for their life and they do not consider what God's will is in their life, you are a rebel too. Jesus says, you are not born again unless you fix the rebellion problem. That is why the type, there are church kids, and they think the only way I can be saved is if I'd be a prostitute. No. How many of you know you don't have to go rob banks? Now I can get saved. No, 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 no. What you have to do is you have to surrender. That's what being born again is all about. The essence of being born again is when you surrender your will to Jesus Christ. That is what Paul did when knocked off his horse. Lord, what would you have me to do? Can I tell you something? I don't care if you attend our church, if you've grown up in our church. I don't care if you started attending If you are not surrendered to Jesus Christ, you are not born again. Being born again involves admitting our need. This is part of the problem. With many people, they are too proud to admit their need. The prodigal, he returned to his father and said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. We had a lovely old couple they started attending. They probably weren't that old back in the day, but Janet Payson, you may know her as Janet Foley. Her parents, they were not like everybody else in our church. Our church was full of hippies and drug addicts, and they were wild-eyed and a little bit crazy. Phil and Pat Payson, that was not them. He was the president of the Kiwanis. He's a golf champion, every civic organization. He, he looked together, and they started attending our church They liked what they saw. As a matter of fact, in the altar call, Phil and Pat would lift their hand. But when it came down to come down here and pray and admit your need, they would stay at the back. And Pastor Mitchell said, if they're going to get saved, they're going to get saved like everybody else. We're not going to make it easy. I'll meet you over to the side. If you're not willing to humble your pride, you cannot be born again. Being born again involves trusting what God said. This is why the Bible says repent and believe the gospel. Moses told them when they're dying, look to this serpent on the pole as we lift it up. Your only hope, you can't fix the snake bite problem. This is the essence of salvation. When they looked to what God provided, then they were saved. We look to Jesus who was lifted up on the cross. There is nothing you can do. God is not interested in you telling him how nice and polite and helpful and involved you are. You can only be born again is if you trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. 
But Jesus says there must be evidence of being born again. Verse 8, the wind blows, you hear the sound of it, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Salvation is internal. It happens on the outside. It's not wear these clothes, wear your hair like... Do, do. No, no, no. Salvation is on the inside, but Jesus says... If something is real on the inside, you will see it. There will be evidence. J.I. Packer says the only proof of past conversion is present convertedness. You say, well, I am a Christian. Let's look at the evidence. Number one, there's the evidence of hunger. Newborns want to eat. I have a granddaughter. She's just about six months old, and that child wants to eat. I got a video yesterday. She ate solid food for the first time. Her and the spoon are in love. <laughs> that spoon came with food. It's like, ah. Her cheeks are growing every day. Be Is Ellie alive? Look at her hunger. She must be. 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow by. Listen to me. If you don't like coming to church, I'm a Christian. I just, I don't want to go to church. You have no appetite for God's word. And you don't want to pray. And you don't want to be a part of the things of God. You are not born again. Because people who are born again, there is Hunger. Number two, there is the evidence of change. Every person who is born again. Listen, your testimony may not be like the person next to you, but there should be something you can point to as evidence. That's usually what we refer to in our testimony. Oswald Chambers said, beware of worshiping Jesus as the Son of God, professing your faith. In him as the savior of the world while you blaspheme him by the complete evidence in your daily life that he's powerless to do anything in and through you. That's a fancy way of saying, don't tell me you've got Jesus on the inside if you can't point to anything that is different since you have been born again. Power over sin. That's what 1 John 3, 8 and 9 uh, says that this reason the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. His seed remains in him. He can't sin. He's been born of God. A few Mondays ago, we're, we're having an outreach on the courthouse plaza. There's a couple. They're, they're, this man is laying. They're all but having sex on the courthouse plaza. Jeannie Bowman went over and began to tell them about Jesus. And immediately as they rolled apart, one member of the party said, yes, I, I go to the Heights, which is the local megachurch. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. We, a minute ago, we just had to get a bucket of water to separate the dogs in heat. And, but you, you, no, 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 no. There, there's something wrong with this picture. No, you're like Nicodemus. You think you're born again. You're not. See, if you're born again, something must change. Let me ask you something. If you tell me you're born again, what is the change? What's changed in your life since you've been born again? Because if nothing has changed, perhaps you're not born again. Then there thirdly, is the testimony of others. It's interesting when people are saved. I, I, I told you where the inspiration for this sermon I saw people whom I've known, I've known when they're not doing good, and now I've seen them, and it's like, wow, they're different. I could see it, I could tell, I could feel it. What, what happened to these people? They got saved. They've been born again. When someone is truly born again, it's not just, you know, this is a private thing on the inside between me and my Lord. Other people should be able to testify about it. Isn't that what they said about Saul? Saul gets knocked off his horse. Lord, what must I do? That's the surrender part. Humbles himself. And then it says, Galatians 1.23, He who 
used to persecute, now he preaches. Saul didn't say that. Other people said it. Here's the problem. If nobody knows that you're saved but you, Challenging young man recently, and I told him, I don't think you're born again. Pastor, how could you say that? I'm a Christian. So I began to go to the people. He's involved in ministry. This guy saved? Uh, I hope so. That's a bad way to go before the Lord on Judgment Day. Friends, he. This person, I couldn't find one person. Absolutely. That's not a good sign. Because there should be evidence to other people. A testimony means there is evidence. Isn't that right? That's why you testify. You don't testify what you heard about. I was there. I saw. I know. If nobody else can testify for you, then maybe you're not born again. When Tom Paine went to Australia, took over a church that had been, the previous pastor had raised an absolute atmosphere of carnality in these, the church was filled with carnal, snaky church kids. Tom Payne was going there, he's very worried, he had a 16-year-old daughter that he's going to bring into that environment. He said, Greg, I'm very nervous about this. But I had gone, you know, long story, but I had been there for a number of weeks it's actually the church I was sent out of many years before. I had had to watch the church for Pastor Mitchell while he came back to sort something out. And so I knew kind of who was there. And Tom said, I'm nervous. I said, listen, Tom, tell your daughter there's a girl named Natalie. There's a whole bunch of snaky, carnal church kids. I, I, I can't say that they're saved. But there's this one girl. When you talk to her, you know. That girl's saved. That was exactly what happened. You know, you know what happened? I was able to testify for something that I saw, something that I felt, not just because she was in church or nice and polite. There was evidence. Let's look finally about the responsibility. Jesus apparently fe feels a responsibility to help Nicodemus feel his need to be born again. Jesus is not concerned with soothing Nicodemus. Lord, I'm this really important guy. I've come to grace you with my presence. And I would like to politely discuss. Jesus wasn't trying to soothe him. Verse 10, he said, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? No, it's my job to help you. Nicodemus, let, let, me, let me tell you, why would I preach this in a Bible conference? Number one, being born again is the pastor's responsibility. So, obviously, it would really help if you're the pastor and you get born again. That would help, but that's not what I'm talking about. Here's the great mystery. You ever seen this? Guys go out to Pioneer. They, they, get, they collect a group of people. They've got 10 people. They've got 20 people. They've got 30 people. You ever seen this? I've, I've gone in and guys have a group of people and I can't identify one person that my spirit bears with. Say, They're really saved. How can that be? People are there. They even said a prayer somewhere. Why is that? Because apparently the pastor is not making them feel the weight of that. Let me ask you, pastor, what are you preaching? What are your altar calls? I'm going to tell you, I've heard some strange altar calls. Christians have fun too, you know. That will not get people saved. You want to be happy? You come to Jesus, be happy. Would you like to accept Jesus? What does that mean? No, you know how you get people saved? Is you challenge them. Nothing left. I'm not asking you to say a prayer. I'm asking you to surrender. I'm asking you to turn from your sin. I'm asking you to live a new life. Do 
You hear me. I tell guys, you've got to preach hope. But you can't preach false hope to unsaved people. If you have people in your church and they are not, it is your job to make them face the need. Jesus said, you must be born. Again, that's the pastor's responsibility. This is a parent's responsibility. Every parent here, you have children. It is your job to challenge your own children about their salvation. Make your children face this. So, you know, the problem is, is when you have parents, and I get this. You, don't, you would hate to see any child that came from your loins wind up in hell. I get that. Okay? But don't be quick to assume. Their parents, they assume. And then their kids answer the altar call and get saved. They're like, I thought you were a Christian. How could they live under your roof and you not know that? That's your job. Don't assume because this child is nice. And listen, you can be a nice, polite, church-going rebel. You don't have to be outward. It doesn't have to be drugs and tattoos. Parents, this is your job. And so... Part of the problem is sometimes I'm trying to save their kids. I'm trying to bring conviction. No, no, I don't think you are saved. There's no evidence. In, show me the evidence. And meanwhile, the parents are going, Mijo, no, I know you're saved. You're a good boy. You're not helping. Jesus makes a nice Moral, polite inquire, face this issue. You must be born again. But ultimately, this is a personal responsibility. Jesus said, you must be born again. No one can do this for you. No one can do it for you. Every person here, you are going to stand alone before God. Mommy is not going to be there. Your pastor's not going to be there. You are going to answer to God. If you're not sure, I have people that go, well, I, 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 I think I'm saved. You don't want to go into eternity thinking so. If you're not converted, you better get converted. You better examine the evidence. You better surrender your heart. You better spend some time with God and work it out. You know, the problem is sometimes people will challenge. They'll push back because they resent the implicate. Are you saying I'm not saved? When I pioneered, we had a number of powerful converts. We arrived on Tuesday. Thursday, we had a Bible study. We had the, the, uh, the wife of the vice president of a local motorcycle uh, 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 gang, Satan's Riders. And so here we are. We're having, I, I had a number of, of great contacts and converts. And so... The lady we first met, she brought her brother. He was a Christian biker. You know what a Christian biker is? He used to be a nice, clean-cut boy, and then he scruffed out. That's worrying. Because he's going to win people to Jesus. He's like dressed. He's a wannabe biker. He hops on his Honda. <laughs> so I, I did my first Bible study on being born again. And he said, well, I, I can't really point to a specific time when I was born again. Are you saying I'm not saved? So, now, Pastor, what do you do right then? I've, I've just gotten in town. I don't know anybody. This is the first man that I've met. Are you saying I'm not saved? But I'm not going to let him off the hook. I said, hey, hey, your argument isn't with me. Your argument is with the Word of God. If you think, I started going to church and gradually I believe more and more in the Lord, show me where that is in the Bible. Because all I have to base it on is Jesus said, you must be born again. I preach. I have, I have church kids. They come and they're like, well, I, I don't know. It was kind of like between when I was 12 and when I was 19. I don't know. Hey, listen. You, 
It's not me you have to convince. I'm going to tell you something. You go into the ministry and you have an indefinite salvation. You have very little chance of getting definite conversions. I'm going to tell you something. I can... I went out to preach the gospel. One of the things I know that I know that I know is I am born again. November of 1978, I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ. So that's why I had no problem challenging people. I don't care what their sin is or if they're just like me. But I was able to tell them, you must be born again. Don't let people off the hook easily. It's not your job to try to convince people that they are saved. Your job is to preach the gospel. Let them make up their mind. And so we see here, this story kind of ends unfinished. Now we know, thank God, that later on, John or, or Nicodemus, the Bible says in John 19, 39, it was Nicodemus who came bring a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. At a later point in time, Nicodemus worked this out. He came and identified with Jesus Christ. And this is what every person has to do. This story has to play out in every single heart. I'm preaching in a Bible conference, and yet I'm confident there are people here, you are not born again. I don't know you, but I know people in general. You're going to have to write the ending to this story for yourself. You have to make up your mind. Is there evidence? What is the change? Am I surrendered? Have I humbled my pride? Am I born again? Kenneth Strong says in his junior year at college, he went to church. After the service, a group of his friends, they knelt down. They wanted to pray. He knelt down with them because he says, I was going to mock them. But when I knelt down with them, they turned to me and they challenged me about my salvation. He said, I wound up surrendering to God. The next day he wrote his mother. He said, I meant to keep still about this news, but I feel too glad about it to keep my mouth shut. Last night, November 30th, you can write it down. R.K. Strong gave up a losing fight. I surrendered to Jesus Christ. He said, the Bible seems new to me. God is with me to help me. He said, I realize I have never been converted before. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place.